All right, and welcome to our Louisiana runoff coverage here at the Citizen Desk HQ. Appreciate you joining us on uh, a Saturday night, and um, we welcome your attempts to reevaluate your life choices as we are, because it's Louisiana and a Saturday night. Uh, joined by many of our regulars here, Scott Tranter, Alex L. Dunstan, and Alexander Podkul. We're here for the runoff in Louisiana's gubernatorial contest because Louisiana is different, not just Saturday nights, but they had an open primary. None of the candidates got above 50%. So here we are with uh, Democratic incumbent John Bell Edwards in a pretty close fight, it looks like, to retain his seat against Republican businessman Eddie Rispone. Uh, most of the polling leading up to this election says it's you know within a percentage point. It, it's going to be uh, a very close race and probably a longer night because of that. We've also seen a lot of excitement or commitment, at least in Louisiana. Early voting and absentee voting is rather high, some of the highest they've seen there, certainly higher than in the, um, the primary. But of course, we want to caution everybody um, you got to wait till the day out comes in. You'll, you'll see some trends maybe in some of these parishes, but until you really have day out coming in to either confirm or show that, you know, there's something else going on, you really can't draw too many conclusions. So we always want to remind people of that. We do expect the first votes within the next five or 10 minutes. They will be trickling in from the parishes. It will be the early and absentee votes in most cases. Um, so that's really what the setup is here. But what's something we did with, um, with our partners at Optimus is we went out and polled the electorate in one of our uh, since we patented not an exit poll, exit poll. So I wanted to uh, start with Alexander Podkul and run through some of those findings to help set the table for what we're going to see tonight. Yeah, hey Drew, thanks so much. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we may have a pretty late night ahead of us, so uh, we're going to start off kind of giving kind of the scope of what the overall electorate is in Louisiana. Just to provide some more context, so we surveyed uh, just over 1,100 voters in the Louisiana uh, who we expect to have voted. And so um, we had asked people, uh, we, we had done our own internal uh, likely voter modeling, and um, then we polled people according to that model. Uh, I'm happy to go into more details if people are uh, interested in this in, in our chat, so let us know across the different uh, fora, I guess is the word. Um, but yeah, so we pulled a bunch of people, we called them, we texted them, uh, we called their cell phones, we called their landlines, and just to try and figure out what they're thinking, what they're feeling, um, and, to pry, and to pretty much try and get a, a better view as to who's making up this Louisiana electorate. And so um, I think there were, a, there were a lot of interesting findings, um, but I guess, we'll, I guess I'll start off just saying we're pretty much in, um, in a deep red state, but there's a lot of uh, opportunity here um, for, for John Bell Edwards. And so just to start off with that, um, one, of the, one of the questions we asked people was, how do you describe your political views? Uh, and, and we asked them on a five point scale from very conservative to very progressive. And among uh, Republicans, we found Republicans reported that uh, one in two identified saying that they are very conservative. On the Democratic side, however, there was a little bit uh, more variability. And actually, the, a plurality of Democrats said that they were moderate. And so this is a little bit unlike some other states uh, where, we've look, where we could look at different surveys that ask this question. Oftentimes in today's polarized politics, we'll see maybe some people are somewhat conservative and then an equal number on the other side. Uh, usually there's a little bit of asymmetry among Republicans and Democrats, but this was pretty staggering that so many voters in the state uh, who were coming out to vote today were on the Democratic side were saying they're moderate. And that makes a lot of sense with John Bell Edwards being, um, being at the top, he's a pretty conservative Democrat. Um, some other issues, uh, we, were just, we just asked people, what are some of the most important issues uh, facing the United States today? And we found for Republicans, the top two issues were immigration and the economy. On uh, the Democratic side, we found health care was the most important. And just to put some numbers on that, immigration was 36% for Republicans. The economy was about 30%. And um, for Democrats, for health care, that was about 27% of the electorate. Other issues, uh, we were just... <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, 
But yeah, so, and then just to turn um, to what everyone, I think a lot of people are interested in is, uh, especially following Kentucky and Mississippi, there was a lot of conversation in light of those elections results about uh, the Trump factor and the Trump influence. So Trump went into Kentucky to campaign on behalf of Matt Bevin a number of times, and so a lot of people read the tea leaves and said, well, if Bevin loses, this is going to be on the hands of Trump, and that's exactly what happened. And so we wanted to study this a little bit more closely and more carefully in Louisiana. So we asked people a bunch of different Trump questions. Uh, what is your Trump favorability? If the presidential election were being held today, would you take on, would you vote for Trump or a generic 2020 Democratic challenger? And over and over and over, we found across these questions that people in Louisiana like Donald Trump. There were big parts of the state where uh, Trump was up 40 points against a generic Democrat. Um, and then uh, his, his net favorable um, was about, uh, I think, plus 15 in the state on our poll. And so overwhelmingly, Trump did very well. But except on, uh, you would think then that would, that would mean good things for Republicans in the state. Until we get to the question, on uh, was Trump a factor in your vote today? So we asked people, is Trump a factor? And we gave them three responses. Response one was Trump, yes, Trump was a factor and my vote was for support. Or we, they said Trump, I'm voting today to oppose Donald Trump. Or most importantly, we said, uh, or people said that Trump was not a factor in their vote whatsoever. And um, a huge plurality of people across all political parties said um, that they felt that Trump was not going to be a factor. So despite what you're going to hear on cable news punditry uh, in light of whoever wins or loses this election, uh, one in two Louisiana voters says this election has nothing to do with Donald J. Trump, um, which if I had to make a prediction about that, I'd say that's probably not a good sign for Eddie Rispone, because it I would guess that people are uh, people would say that you're Trump's not going to be a factor, particularly if you're going to vote across your partisan interests. But we're going to keep kind of turning back to this poll, and there's, there are some other nuggets in here, particularly on some of the issues that we're going to talk about later. But I've already been talking for way, way too long. There's a couple of questions in there. You yeah. To, um, a little bit, talk a little bit of how we did it and why it's not an exit exit poll, how we estimated the profile of the electorate. Yeah, so uh, I guess there are two parts of that question, at least, that I'm reading. The first is kind of how we did it. And um, so we used uh, the voter file in Louisiana. And uh, the voter file has a lot of information about voters, especially um, in Louisiana, where we know uh, key demographic information about particular voters. We know what party they're registered to. We know what elections they have voted, voted in in the past, um, and all these sorts of uh, data points. Now, using that data, then we estimate kind of a model of who do we expect uh, to turn out to vote. Then using these scores, we then sample people, uh, and then we reach out to them via a number of modes. And so we did, um, we did live calls. We also did uh, some interactive voice responses. And then also we did um, a peer-to-peer -peer text message to web survey. So we text people. We ask them to participate in the survey. Um, and then they give us their they give us their opinions. Then um, we we were in the field starting November twelfth all the way until uh, last night we were up, and so that's part of the reason why it's not an exit poll. Uh, an exit poll is when you're walking outside your polling location and you talk to someone and they and and they immediately get their responses right after someone voted. In this case, uh, we were not standing outside of uh, polling locations, but we were doing our best to estimate what the electorate looked like. And so it's similar to an exit poll in that we're trying to learn some of the same lessons that a traditional exit poll does by looking at the views and some of the de demographic data that we have on the electorate. Um, however, it's a little bit different just in terms of the methodological decisions that we're making. And so we sort of jokingly called our North Carolina 9 exit poll a not an exit exit poll. And I guess that name has somehow stuck for the, for the time being. Um, so it has some of the features. We, get, we learn the same things from this poll. However, it's conducted a little bit differently. There are fewer, and, fewer and people in cl with clipboards. I can interrupt one second. Yeah. One reason we do that is because what we're seeing now is some of this early voting started to report in. You can't exit poll people necessarily who are mailing in ballots. Um, 
or getting a, an accurate sample if you're going to your own location, location it may not be, you know, indicative of the entire electorate. electorate. So as the way people change their voting habits in many, many states, the ability to get what was driving them has to change as well. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this. Exactly. I mean, we have states, uh, we have states like Washington State where uh, 100% of the vote is by mail. And so if you had some exit poll uh, gatherers standing outside of polling precincts, they'd get a little cold and lonely because no one votes in that state. Then in other places like in North Carolina 9, where we ran our last not an exit exit poll, uh, at that that in that district, it's so variable where there have been elections where up to 65% of the electorate votes by absentee or by by mail or by early vote. Um, and so you have, uh, as this becomes a more common way for people to vote, it just becomes a little bit harder for people to be reached using traditional exit poll metrics. If we can switch over to the vote goal sheet, it looks like we're getting our first results in. Um, so we shared this with everyone tonight. It's on the blog. It's in your chat streams. Uh, what you're looking at here is basically a vocal scenario um, based on a couple of different turnout scenarios that we had come up with. We'll talk about that more later. But in Louisiana, it's parishes. So you guys can um, go in and explore this yourselves. We made it available to the public. But here's all the parishes. If they're highlighted yellow, they're key parishes. I'll talk about that later. We have precincts in. Um, we have parish share of the first round election. In other words, how much of the total vote share do we expect this parish to be? It's not, I'm sorry, not expect what it was in the first round and the total votes in. So right now in, I apologize, I'm going to butcher these names for us tonight. In Bienville, there's 1,524 votes in. In our high turnout model, we expect 4,600 more votes out of this parish, 4,100 in our mid, and 3,700 in our low. Currently, um, John Bell Edwards is sitting at 60-40, and he's 8% above his vote goal. And we just got a whole bunch more results in, and you can see this sheet li update live here. And you can basically track here whether someone is on pace to get their win condition or not. Um, here's the all parishes. Here are the key parishes we're looking at, Bossier, Caddo, East Baton Rouge. And in this sheet, you can see here, we have some key breakdowns, African-American registered voter breakdown, Edwards percent in 2019, just some interesting th things to kind of look at there. And then finally, we break down by DMA. DMA is how the TV is spent um, and where a lot of the, uh, the voter contact uh, money goes. It's really where the battle lines are. So you guys can check this out. We'll be referencing it a lot tonight. Basically, this is what we're looking at as we're trying to figure out how we're going to call the race. Um, with that, just looking at what's coming in, in the key parishes, I mean, Jefferson's a big one. East Baton Rouge is a big one. Let's start with Jefferson. 32,000 votes in, in a high turnout scenario, we think there's 100,000 votes left, 88,000 in a mid. Um, right now, John Bell Edwards is, is, is trending above his win condition by about three and a half percent, three and a third percent. Um, still way early in the night, but gives you an idea in Jefferson. Jefferson is about 26% registered African American and he got 52% of the vote in the October 2019 election. Just to give you an idea, in his runoff in 2015, he's at 50%. So he's trended up. This will be a key one to watch tonight. Um, East Baton Rouge, there's a lot of votes to come out of there, 160,000 votes. Um, you can kind of see where, where this is all going to come down to. And one, one note of caution on these early numbers coming in. These are uh, all early votes, um, absentee early votes. Um, and so the composition of those and the composition of election day voters tends to be pretty different. So as you follow this sheet, um, as counties start getting to 100% of precincts reporting, um, that's when these uh, vote goals um, really, really give a, a clear picture of what's going on. So just uh, keep that in mind as you start tracking these early in the night. We're also tracking the chat in, um, in our various live streams. Um, one question that we got uh, was how uh, in this environment, um, in this partisan climate, how can a Democrat even be competitive in a red state? 
uh, like Louisiana. Um, do you have any thoughts there? Well, he's he um, Edwards is not followed the national Democratic line. They, they he signed a uh, a fairly stringent uh, abortion law. Um, he expanded Medicaid, which was a uh, big campaign issue in 2015. Um, you know, he's generally a good fit. We see this in the in the reverse as well, too, as you see Charlie Baker in, in Massachusetts or Larry Hogan in, in Maryland doing well in states where you would say, well, how can a Republican get into one of those states? And the, I think those states just, you know, those candidates fit the states. That's big. Um, how they govern, how they go about it. And there are some places where people will still, you know, look at at the candidates. Yet one thing to remember too about Edwards is he won in large part in 2015 because Bobby Jindal was terribly unpopular. He had tried a um, healthcare uh, reorganization of the state's um, public health system was very unpopular. Edwards had promised that he would um, expand Medicaid under uh, Obamacare. Senator David Vitter was had his own issues in the past, um, and that enabled Edwards to uh, enable an opening for him for a Democrat to come in and, and and to win in a very Republican state. But ultimately, he's going to be judged in the last four years, and that's what today is about. Um, so sometimes there has to be, I think, a uh, a confluence of events. And you have to have the right candidate. And sometimes that still matters. Candidates matter. It's not purely, uh, you know, foreordained in a lot of places. But again, he needed a break with the unpopularity of Jindal and running against a relatively weak opponent in Vitter. And we'll see what people think about the job he's done now. Let's pull up the polling. I mean, we got some early results in, which is good. But there was a couple of polls released last minute today. Um, data for progress is one. They essentially, I mean, not essentially, they had it 50 50. JMC Analytics, um, good guy to follow on this. Um, if you can find him on Twitter, um, he essentially had it tied as well. Um, you can see this go down, um, down the line, just all the polls released in the last two weeks, um, you know, which is why we think it's going to be a late night tonight. Um, I don't know, Pod Cool, any observations on any of the. Any of the observations? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, other than the fact that it's statistically tied, if I didn't tell you this was Louisiana, you'd probably think this is like a Wisconsin or a Florida in terms of how it is. But it is Louisiana, a state we, we normally think is Republican, which makes it kind of surprising that it is this close. John Bell Edwards is the, the Democratic incumbent. Um, Trump was in, uh, where was he in last night, Drew? He was in, what parish was he in? Oh, you know, I have that right here, actually. He was in, what is the name of this parish? Oh, God, I'm gonna, this will be one I butcher. Bossier. Um, it's right across the river from Shreveport, gotcha. which is in Cato County, Cato County, a uh, parish, excuse me. Um, so it's kind of interesting wondering why they picked those. It, it's like I said, it's the northwest corner. Um, Barksdale Air Force Base is there. Yeah. And Shreveport is the major uh, city in the region. Well, let's take a look at it. So Boss, we have Bossier and Cato right here. Sorry, I'm going to go to my super awesome sheet here. Um, a little bit more detailed than the public one. Bossier and Cato. We have no votes in there right now. Um, so we're not sure, we don't have any other results from there, but Bossier and Cato, ABEV, I mean, it looks like, according to the ABEV, 57% of it's Republican in Bossier, Bossier, 34% in Cato, so, you know, not necessarily on edge there. Um, Bossier is more more Republican, Cato is more Democrat. Bossier is 81% Caucasian, whereas Cato is 52% Caucasian. Decently sized counties. Yeah, I mean, there's no obvious reason why he was there. I mean, it doesn't mean there isn't a reason. We're just kind of looking at the data here. We'll see, it'll be interesting as this stuff comes in. Um, right now we have no votes in from there, but you know, we'll see if they, it had the Trump effect. They need, um, 
yeah just looking at some of this stuff as it comes in see as it is by dma um alex can or austin can you switch real quick we have the we have this the tv spend for medium buying by dma right if you can pull that up so if you're on the results sheet that we've been sharing, we've been tracking the votes by DMA, which is not a breakdown the state gives you. It's something we've calculated, but it gives you an idea. Um, that's the vote share. Do we have the spend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Er, go back one, right here. Okay. So those, which, which is on the screen right now, is these are the various DMAs, and this is how media buyers buy television. So Edwards has spent a little less than $9 million. Responi spent a little less than $10 million. And when they buy it, they buy it in these huge DMAs. So New Orleans is a, is a DMA. You can see it, it's that dark blue in the lower right. Shreveport's a DMA, it's that light blue in the upper left. To give you an idea, in Shreveport, um, currently 1% of the precincts are in. Um, it represented 10% of the overall vote. And right now, um, Responi's up four points. In the Shreveport DMA, we think there's between 140 and 160,000 votes left. And in Shreveport, um, I guess we don't have the DMA spend. We'd have to get that from Nick later on. But it just gives you an idea of where some of the dollar amounts are going based on vote share, which is always interesting. Let's go back. Let's go back to the, uh, the vote goal sheet there, Austin. Looks like we got a little bit in in Jefferson Davis Parish, a little bit more in, in Jefferson. I mean, overall in the key parishes, it's too early to tell. There's not enough votes in. Edwards is over yeah. overperforming a little bit in Jefferson, underperforming in Jefferson Davis, um, underperforming in oh man, T Tangia Pahoa. I'm gonna butcher <laughs> that. I apologize. Yeah, it's looking yeah. pretty good. What do you see, Drew? Well, this is there about, well, not about. Um, according to John Kuvian, who, who tracks this, he's in Louisiana, there were 503,000 and change, 140 to be precise, um, early and um, absentee ballots in. So, you know, we're at about 300,000, so just over half or so of that is in. Um, presuming most of this 300,000 and change that we see so far is the early Navy voting. Um, I don't know, considering that this was considered perhaps a, a little more democratic um, early voting, it's hard to tell because of where it's coming from and where it still has to come from, but I don't know, do you think it benefits anybody? And after saying we should, you know, be kind of casual about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we're just looking at some of this stuff comes in. Um, let's go to Twitter. I mean, Washburn's got some interesting stuff. J. Miles Coleman is having the time of his life right now. Louisiana um, native. Yeah, Louisiana native. Um, so, go ahead. So one interesting thing uh, that Wasserman is pointing out. So the early vote was higher this time around than last time. Um, it seems like John Bell Edwards is doing better in the early vote. Um, this time around than last time as well, which uh, could be a good sign for him because we don't we don't necessarily expect that uh, just because the early vote is higher that turnout will be significantly higher than it was in the first round. But the fact that he's doing better among a larger share of the electorate might be uh, a good sign for him. Uh, definitely want to wait for some election day votes to see. Uh, because it could be the case that the election day uh, vote ends up being even more polarized than it was last time as well. But um, it's, uh, it's at, at the very least a decent time for Edwards early. Sorry, we're just looking at some of this stuff as it comes in. Um, Austin, switch over the polling. Real quick, while we wait for more of this stuff to come in. Yeah, again, just to kind of reiterate where we're at on some of this, it is tied. Um, Louisiana, um, the ABEV um, is all in, and 
we're going to see a little bit of that. That's what we're seeing a little bit of now. We're waiting for some of the bigger stuff to come in. But this is Louisiana. This is basically a tide race. Um, it's about as close as it gets. Um, we're all drinking caffeine here because we think it's going to be a little late. Um, it's interesting in our own um, polling, which we did, is and not necessarily for the horse race, but more so we can get an idea of what what's going on with the electorate. We found that the electorate was largely Republican, um, which no shit, it's Louisiana. Um, but you know, being a Republican state and having an incumbent Democratic governor being essentially 50-50 going into election day um, should be surprising. I think a lot of people are looking at this race and trying to correlate it with Kentucky. Um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I wouldn't draw too much out of Kentucky, what happened with uh, Bevin back there and what's going on here now. Um, Louisiana's kind of its own state in terms of how they deal with some of these issues. Yeah. Switching back to the results, pull up the results again, just the results dashboard there, Austin. Overall, depending on what you think, the, the first round exceeded a lot of our expected vote goals by, or exceeded our high turnout models. Um, so, you know, we're going to give you a wide range, but we have some scenarios where turnout's above 1.5 million, which is pretty significant. So that tells you, you know, we've got about 320,000 total votes in. So if we think there's, you know, a decent chance we get between 1.4 and 1.7, We've got about a mil, mil and a half votes um, to go. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll wait we'll wait and watch and see as it comes in. You want to pull over to the precinct map for me, Austin? One of the things we're doing tonight uh, as we test, and you guys will see some of this with, with our results partners next year, is there's, a, there's about 20 plus states in which, which we can get live precinct results. Um, and so we have our engineering team pulling down the live precinct results right now and then updating it live to a map. Um, and you can check out that map, it's an interactive map on the website. Um, it is something we're playing around with, so we're not guaranteeing the results or how it all looks and how quick it is. Um, it's on a completely different system than our county level stuff, um, but it's something we're playing around with tonight and you can kind of see how it all works. Um, not a lot in, that's why it's all gray, but it'll start lighting up as more and more votes come in. Um, Go down to uh, Louisiana down there a little bit, Austin. Zoom in, lower right-hand side. I'm not Louisiana, uh, New Orleans. Yeah, zoom in a little bit more. So everyone can kind of see we're going into Louisiana. Find a parish, find a precinct with some votes in it so we can get an example. Uh, we'll still wait for a couple, but that's something you guys can go check out. Podcool, you good to kind of hit some of the highlights? In fact, can we pull up? Podcool had a little bit of a little bit of beer, and then went on the Twitters and highlighted some things for us on. Let me pull it up for everybody. Awesome! Can you pull up this tweet? thread no sorry that's fine yeah, so over on our Twitter account, which is at Decision Desk HQ, but you probably know that or else you probably wouldn't be here right now. Um, we did a we did a little bit of a tweet thread um, putting together some of the results from our not an exit exit poll. Um, and so we could we don't need to kind of walk through the whole thing. Um, but Austin, go to the uh, there's a DMA map in in that tweet thread. I think you sent the wrong tweet thread. That's fine. I think we've had too many hurricanes and beignets.
It's all good. I think Scott sent along the wrong tweet thread. Um, but essentially, we were just talking about this not an exit, exit poll. And um, one of the features I think that's pretty neat, even if you could just, yeah, there we go. That's perfect. Um, one, of the, one of the things we were looking at, so Scott was mentioning uh, DMA, designated market area. And that's how a lot of candidates will figure out their spend. Um, and that's, that's as, as Scott just said, it's kind of where some of the battle lines are um, in some of these campaigns, how they're played out. And yeah, Austin, go down to the, the map at the bottom. And what we did here was we kind of just broke down. So we asked, we asked voters in Louisiana, if the 2020 presidential election were being held today, would you vote for Trump, uh, a, gener a, a Democratic challenger? You don't know. Or you would, or someone else, or you wouldn't vote. And um, pretty overwhelmingly, which makes sense because Louisiana is a pretty deep red state uh, in terms of the national political uh, features. This was uh, there were there were no designated market areas that had a generic uh, Democrat up. And in fact, the, uh, in the whole center part of the state, from north to south, we had Trump uh, up 40 points uh, when we broke out those. Uh, DMA numbers and so up 40 which is huge now again um, those areas aren't nearly as populated uh, as some of the eastern part of the state especially as we get to to New Orleans and some of those areas um, where Trump just had a narrow single-digit lead um, but uh, what we found was Trump's standing in the poll uh, against a generic Democrat is nearly identical to where his lead was in 2016. So we had him statewide, uh, we had him just under 20 points ahead of a generic Democrat. And in 2016, uh, he beat Hillary Clinton by just under uh, 20 points. And so nearly identical, not a lot of movement at the top of the ticket. And so probably a smart move for Rispone to tie himself to the president as much as he could um, and for the president to come to town um, as trying to nationalize this race as much as we could. Although, as Drew was talking about earlier, uh, Bell Edwards, pretty conservative Democratic governor, especially um, if we look at some of his uh, some of those uh, abortion um, restrictions, education, there are some pretty conservative um, he has a pretty conservative record considering he's a Democratic incumbent. Um, but again, again, we're sitting here on a live stream telling you that the, uh, out of, that the party that's currently out of office is trying to nationalize this race as much as they possibly can. So what are we, what are we getting in, um, Scott? Do we see anything coming up on the vote goals or... Or any results, or are we yeah, just kind of sitting waiting? Let's keep. Let's go back. Check out the key parishes again. All right, we got some in from Jefferson Davis. Not a lot. Four thousand votes. Um, there's probably about five to six thousand votes left there for a key one. John Bell Edwards is running about two and a half percent, two percent behind his his performance metrics. Um, we just got our first stuff in from Morehouse. Not enough, 330 votes, so not enough to really conclude anything. Um, you know, Bossier and Caddo, that's, that's right out where Trump did his rally the other night. That's so we're still waiting to see what that kind of looked like. Um, East Baton Rouge is the biggest nut out there with 160,000 votes in our high turnout. We have nothing in from there. Uh, you know. 934 results or polls have been closed for about a half hour now so you know we'll say that the common refrain it's too early to call although going into tonight if we can switch back to the polling there austin real quick who would you rather be going into tonight given all the polling if i'm would you I mean, rather be john bell edwards or would you rather be um respondent uh i mean it looks it it looks like the momentum is behind Responi going into tonight. Uh, if we look at some of the the polls uh, going into this week, even kind of preceding um, preceding the polls that we have on the screen here, it looked like Responi was was kind of the man on the rise. Uh, however, Edwards has been consistently ahead. Um, I think it's probably the type of situation where a high turnout scenario might, probably benefits Responi here. Um, 
But I don't know. What are, you, what are kind of your thoughts, Scott? I, I think the momentum pl- is kind of what people are talking about, at least. Yeah, I know. They're certainly talking about the momentum. I guess what I would say, it's Louisiana. It's a Republican state. Um, it, it's something that the RNC, um, the RGA, and to be honest, Trump wants to win. If we want to get really inside baseball here, Trump's political director, Chris Cars, of Louisiana, um, native. He is one of the preeminent experts on voter contact and get out the vote. It's, it's a state the RNC did testing in, on voter contact testing in, in 2014. Um, I mean, they have the organization, they're going to spend the money, and they want to win after Kentucky. So, you know, while the media coverage has been all about, you know, momentum for John Bell Edwards, I, 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 I could be wrong, and obviously, you know, I, I come from a bias because I know these folks, but ground game's got to go to Responi. Now, Um, if you're Trump, now I'm just like thinking out loud, if you're Trump, why would you even go into this race? Because if you're Trump, this is an only lose situation. If Responi wins, then the comment is, okay, a Republican wins a state that is a plus 20 GOP favorite. Like, Trump isn't going to get any pats on the back for keeping a red state red. A win is a win. A win is a win. What's but, that? Also, he'll, get, he'll get credit for flipping it. If it were, you know, a GOP hold, he might not get as much credit. But if you say, hey, we went out and we beat the Democrats, you know, you're taking something away from them. That can be spun into a positive. The, the, the uh, other thing you're forgetting, uh, Podcool, is that, uh, you know, the last race that he got into uh, in Kentucky, he, uh, he took Bevin from down, what was it, 20 points, uh, he said? to just barely losing. So if, if you're Trump and you're looking at these uh, polls, you know, you're thinking, well, if I go to Louisiana, uh, Responi might win by double digits. Uh, so for those who are new, uh, Al Dunson is being a troll right now. <laughs> <laughs> just to get everybody clued up as to what's happening. But okay, so Drew, I, t- I think you raise a good point that if it's a flip, he could put his name on it. Well, that's exactly what it is. You're gonna come out and you say, "I won. I came to the state. I did a rally, and I fucking won." Well, he did. I mean, he now did. Again. He did. I mean, he did three rallies in the state in just over a month. He only yeah. did. He only did two for Responi. The third was that very odd where he got on a stage and held Congressman Abraham's hand as well as Eddie Responi's hand and said, oh, just vote for one of these guys. Um, but he only came into the state twice. Uh, presumably, he, he went into areas where their campaign was saying, if we could bring up the turnout here, then maybe there's a bit of a game changer. But I, if, I'm, if I'm Trump and trying to learn the lesson from Kentucky, I don't know, maybe I'd be less inclined to, to do something. Maybe. Let's switch over to the vocals real quick. We got our first votes in from the Trump parishes, Bossier and Caddo. Yeah, I know. I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Just be happy I'm not counting, calling it counties. Um, in Bossier, with 6,900 votes in, between 23,000 and 27,000 votes left, John Bell Edwards is 18% above his win condition. He's 8% below his win condition in Caddo with about 50 to 60,000 votes left. So still a long way to go. Too early to call anything. At least we're getting some votes in from there. Got our first votes in from East Baton Rouge, um, which is good. Um, East Baton Rouge with the first set of votes in, still 130,000 votes to go. Um, We got John Bell Edwards, 17% below. Um... The vocal, sorry, I'm just looking at all this. I, I don't know. This is going to swing back and forth a lot for the rest of the night. And that's a place where Edwards, I think, has to do pretty well today, especially especially if um, he's got to run. He's got to run up yeah. the score there. So if we look at look, the 2015 runoff, uh, yeah, Edwards' he, victory over Vitter, he had about six, almost 68 percent of the vote. Yeah. Um, but then in the first round, just a few weeks ago, he was at 62 percent. Yeah. Um, I think he's. In order for this night um, to be going pretty well, he's got to hover a little bit above where that 62% yeah. is. Yeah. If anyone wondered why we were talking about East Baton Rouge and then noticed 33,000 votes disappeared, 
It is the Russians. No, just kidding. It is not the Russians. This happens. Louisiana is an all electronic vote state. Um, our system pulls the votes in and then goes through a tracking process. Um, and sometimes, and this happens quite a bit more often than people realize, some votes get pulled back and retallied and pulled back into the system. Something that happens normally. Not the Russians, right, Podcool? Podcool doesn't want to confirm it's not the Russians. Uh, <laughs> it, I mean... <laughs> Let's see if any of these out parishes are in. Yeah, Podcool's putting on a tin hat right now. Wow. Wow. Um, we've got a cool little map here. I mean, this represents you. where Responi's winning. Not too bad. I mean, he's got to win... You know, New Orleans is where John Bell Edwards needs to bring it home. Inside the DMAs, this New Orleans DMA. Yeah, all this is coming in. Looking good for Responi. Looking good. Sorry, we're just looking at a bunch of stuff. So kind of before uh, we we're getting into the East Baton Rouge mess, we were talking a little bit about the Trump play in this race. Austin, could we possibly pull up the... Um, the advertisement from Responi, just because I think we may have shown this in the primary, I guess, first round election live stream that we did. Um, but this is just such a great advertisement and just shows you kind of, again, how desperately they're trying to nationalize this race. I'm Eddie Responi. I supported President Trump against Hillary. Gave him money. Put a bumper sticker on my truck. And I support our president more than ever. Against these liberal lunatics running out. Eddie Responi, conservative outsider, pro Trump. As governor, I'll work with President Trump to protect our constitutional rights, to ban sanctuary cities, and end taxpayer benefits for illegal immigrants in Louisiana. I'm Eddie Responi, and I stand with President Trump. Podcool's Pod from Jersey, so he thinks anything south of Maryland is funny. <laughs> I just I don't know what's better than the fact that he starts sitting in the bed of a pickup truck with the bumper sticker just directly over his shoulder, or the fact that there's a Yeti cooler right next to him in the bed of the pickup Clearly truck. Clearly you don't know how to win elections in Louisiana. Clearly. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> and I guess for now, parody, now which one the podcast, which one's better though? This one or the Jeff Sessions hostage tape? One. <laughs> Can we pull that up? Do we have that? Uh, no, we don't oh. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I don't. I, I don't know how one ties themselves to Trump any more clearly as as that. Yeah. Um, let's go back to the key parishes. What do we got here? Nothing too big. Nothing too big moving just yet. 420,000 total votes in. Nothing too interested. I mean, John Bell Edwards... And more of the key parishes than Responi is above his vocals. We figure there's probably between 9 and 1.3 million votes left. So a lot, a lot of places to go. I mean, the big one, East Baton Rouge, he's got to kill it there. He's currently at 7. John Bell Rouge is currently at 74%. Responi's at 25 now. 
John Bellwood is going to win East Baton Rouge, but the question is by how much. He's certainly got to be above 62-63% in that parish to, 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 to win tonight. Um, and based on how it's going in some of the other parishes, he might have to be above 65-66. What are we at in uh, Morehouse right now? Morehouse, we got 6,300 votes in on the high side, another 2,500 votes to go. And John Bell Edwards is 4.5% above his pace. And he's at? He's at 49 and a half. 49 and a half. So, I mean, in the, if we look at 2015, in the first round, Edwards was at 45%. And then, then he jumped up to 56% in Morehouse Parish. And if we're kind of using that as a baseline, which I'm not necessarily saying we are, but if we use that kind of as a baseline, then it seems to be that we may expect that Edwards might even, might even need to do a little bit better if, we're, if he's going to translate that jump. And in the first round of 2019, he was down to 41%, 41.5%. And so um, that might be, I mean, we're, we were listing it as a key parish we want to watch, um, but we'll see kind of as the rest of the precincts roll in there. Yeah. Um, let's see if there's anything interesting happening on Twitter. Where's Jay Miles? Come on, give me something to put up here. I just want to know real quick. Yeah. About the Jeff Sessions video. Do you want to play that right now? All right, we're gonna hold the Jeff Sessions video for a, a, a dull moment here. Um, I've got a Jay Miles tweet. We got to talk about. For those of you who don't know, Jay Miles is from Louisiana, is one of the most prolific map makers in all of the virtual world of elections, and uh, probably hasn't slept in a week. Pulling this up here, again, East Baton Rouge, which is one of the key parishes we're looking at, um, East Jefferson Parish, New Orleans suburbs, using some of those cheap in this. 26% Obama. I mean, this is what Jay Miles is looking at, and obviously something we're looking at in that vocal sheet. It'll be interesting to see how this one breaks out. Um, scroll up. This is the, I want to see the tweet because he retweeted it. Yeah. In the first precincts, JB is running 1 to 3% of how he did in 2015. That's the key there. Um, if we think the GOP turnout machine is, is going to try and make up some ground, um, they're not going to do it in you know New Orleans. They're going to do it in some of these, these outer parishes. And so John Bell Edwards needs to overperform in vote-rich areas like Jefferson, like East Baton Rouge. And so, you know, with still about a million votes to go, currently JBE is 1 to 3 percent of how he did in 2015. And how he did in 2015 just in case anyone is curious, we have that in Jefferson County. He got 50.6% of the vote. And in 2019, just back in October, he got 52.9%. So it's been trending up. He's running 1% to 3% ahead of that. So he's on pace for his, his October vote, which was good, which was good then. Not good enough to avoid a runoff. But right. But good enough to uh, good enough to win, and show an improvement there. Um, going back to the key parishes real quick, Austin. Not too much has come in. Bossier and Cotto are still kind of where they're at. East Baton Rouge. Yeah. Pretty interesting. I don't know. You see anything interesting, Alex? So, uh, I don't respond. You know, the, for instance, betting markets right now have it at about an 80% chance of John Bell Edwards winning. And I think a lot of that is just the strength of the early vote. But we really haven't gotten a great sense of the election day vote yet. Um, so I wonder if they are being a little bit. Uh, too confident uh, on that. Yeah. Well, we also haven't seen anything from New Orleans either, right? So that's still a big, a big pot for for Edwards and the Democrat as the as the Democrat rather. 
All right, here's a question for the virtual room while we wait for uh, some more results to roll in. Sometimes um, when we're talking about Louisiana, you'll hear people s when they're trying to make when they're trying to extrapolate lessons from the first round vote to the second round, they'll say, well, if we add up all the Republicans and then we just add up all the Democrats, then that's probably what the result is going to look like. Why is that a dumb thing to do? That seems pretty logical on the on the surface. Sorry, I'm just looking at some results. Oh my gosh. Why that's is that a great dumb question? Not yeah. all of them show up. That's why. So is, is it what just a turn, turn is it just a, a turnout thing? It is a turnout turnout thing, right? Like my fav one of my favorite things when I talk about Iowa tonight, but Iowa's about a million registered voters. Um and what? In a in a contested Dem primary and a contested GOP primary, you might have a total four hundred thousand participating voters. In a, in a caucus, in a, in a dual, you know, that's roughly what it was in 2016, about 400, 450. Yeah. It means about over half the, the state that was registered to vote, not even all eligible voters, the people registered to vote said, fuck it, it's Saturday night, it's cold in January, I'm not going to show up. And so that's why we say we don't just add up everyone because, you know, I'm sure there's people who are listening to this stream tonight in Louisiana who's just like, you know what, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to watch the election and I'm going to commentate on it and I'm still not going to vote. But Scott, I mean, do I need to say welcome to the jungle? We are in the jungle <laughs> primary here. In 2015, in the, tw in the 2015 <laughs> gubernatorial race, there was 1.1 million people turned out in the first round. Yeah. In the second round, 1.15 million people turned out. Yeah, yeah. I'm not asking about like, I understand your point, but this is that's kind of apples and oranges here because you can't just add up like yes if you add up Bernie Sanders plus Hillary plus Martin O'Malley that's obviously a poor way to talk about the general but here we're talking about an open party primary that's the question is in Louisiana why is it an unwise decision to just add up Republicans and add up Democrats let's assume say turnout oh, remains because your argument constant. is is they your argument is the open primary they're gonna like screw around and you know vote for whoever they want no, 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 no. I'm saying in a... Uh, what, what are you saying? Because right now, yeah, we're in yeah, a, Just say it. Just say just, it. Just say what you're saying. All right. Well, maybe you guys need to listen instead. It's All right, not Professor about Popple. this. All no, right. I'm just making a comment. We are in a jungle primary. It is an open party primary because there's no such thing as the primary here. In the first round of the primary, it, uh, what people will sometimes say when they are analyzing the election is they'll say add up the Republicans and who voted for the Republicans and add up who voted for the Democrats and make that comparison and extrapolate it to the second round election because people can vote across party lines in the first round election. Okay. And so I'm just simply asking why is that a bad idea? I don't, I, I mean it's an idea. <laughs> is that is that something is that something well, we it is that depends I think on on the nature of the primary right like yes it's an open primary but it was really from the Republican side it's it's Rusboni versus um, uh, who was it? Ralph Abrams Ralph Abraham rather um, you know is it a is it a nasty primary is it one where people are like screw that guy he knifed my guy in the back and I'm never going to vote for him so they stay home I don't get the sense that necessarily that was this kind of primary I know Rusboni's ads focused heavily on Abraham, but, you know, Trump went down and made the appeal and said, hey, you know, doesn't matter which one of you guys, which one of these guys you vote for, you just got to go vote. And then he made them t say something, you know, he let them speak and he said, but you can't say anything mean about anybody here. So if it's a really except the media, bought, bitter kind of thing, it probably is matters. But if it's just, hey, it's party, it might not matter as much. And you maybe can do that math. Let's switch over to the precinct map. So we are doing live precinct results tonight. Um, Austin, if you want to switch over there. You guys can check this out on the website. It's interactive map. You can play around with it. Can you pull up um, Jefferson on the map, Austin? Jefferson Parish. All right, so this is Jefferson Paris. We're zoomed in New Orleans here. Um, just so everyone understands what this map is up there. Currently, there are 52,000 votes in, in Jefferson. 
Um, Edwards is a half a point behind his win condition there. He's sitting at 55.8% in the parish. Um, still a significant amount of New Orleans to come in. But you can kind of see where it is. These are all the different precincts. Yeah, you want to zoom in a little bit more there, Austin? I, I, I don't think anyone can read this. I and mean, we can see the colors. Will the size of the box stay the same? Oh, yeah. Anyway, point is, is there's a lot of precincts to come in in Jefferson Parish, and that's a place John Bell Edwards is about a half a point behind his pace, and he really needs to pick it up. Um, we'll drop the link in the chat. You guys can play around with it yourself. Um, it's fully interactive. Um, cool. You want to switch over to the not an exit exit poll stuff again for all the new followers or people just tuning in. Podcool, you want to give a quick rundown of that? Yeah, so uh, we surveyed uh, about 1,100 uh, likely voters in the gubernatorial runoff here in Louisiana. And we weren't looking for the ballot question. We we're just looking at how can we better understand this electorate in the state. Um, and so what, we're, what we did was we asked them a, a bunch of questions. First, we asked some of the standard demographic questions. And then we also asked some of the ideology questions. What are some of the issues uh, that they're looking at here? Um, and uh, what are the issues that are most important? How do they kind of describe themselves uh, on an ideological spectrum? Um, and a few different other questions like this. And, and I think there were a few things that we learned. The first um, is that uh, Louisiana really is as conservative uh, as people say it is. So we asked people on a five point scale from very conservative to very progressive to place themselves. And um, Republicans, a, a plurality of Republicans said that they were very conservative. A plurality of Democrats actually said they were moderate. Um, which I think is a little bit telling of the political landscape here. And it makes sense that uh, of all Democrats to be elected to the governor's mansion in Louisiana, that it would be uh, John Bell Edwards, um, as he's a, a pretty conservative Democrat um, in today's ideological landscape. Uh, another thing that uh, I don't think we've talked about um, yet, yeah, maybe we have, I need to put down the hurricanes, but we asked people, so how is your financial situation compared to four years ago? And this is a, a good way of asking people what their, what their thoughts of uh, economic performance have been. And so we broke this out by party and we have the cross tabs available on the website. So check out the blog decisiondeskhq.com if that's your type of thing. But we asked people, so how is your financial situation compared to four years ago? And 65% of Republicans say uh, it's better. And so they're saying the economy is working out for them. Um, but a plurality of Democrats uh, just said it was 45% was about, is about the same. So the, uh, their financial situation is about the same as it was four years ago, which is an interesting question and generally correlates uh, with whoever is in the White House. Republican or people tend to like the economy when their team, quote unquote, is in uh, the White House. Uh, and that's a, that was a pretty interesting divide we saw. And an, another big divide we saw um, was on the types of issues that people care about. Uh, Republicans, immigration and the economy were the top, top uh, issues. For Democrats, health care um, was number one with uh, the economy trailing a little bit behind it. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll get, we're going to kind of keep talking about this throughout the night. But if you're interested, uh, decisiondeskhq.com, we have the blog post um, up there, as well as a link to where the top lines, cross tabs, and other methodological details are. I'm just looking at, see if there's anything interesting to pull out. If we go to the vocal sheet, Austin, just so we can see. Morehouse has 97% of the precincts in. If you believe Wasserman, and Wasserman's pretty good, he doesn't think there's very many votes left. And based on our vote turnout models, we think at most there's about 600 votes left. And so that's a pretty good example. Morehouse, Edwards is at 51%. He's 6% above his win condition in that parish. Um, that's probably with 650,000 votes in, 
anywhere from 800,000 to a, you know 700,000 to a million votes on the real high side left. Um, we can say Morehouse. I mean, that's trending good for John Bell Edwards. He's at what percent? Well, in the Morehouse Key Parish, he's six and a half percent above his win condition there. Now, it's not a lot of votes. There's only going to be about 9,000 votes in that parish at a 1.5 million cast, but it's something to look at. Worth pointing out, uh, Trump won that parish by 11 points. Yeah. Won it by 11 points, 47% registered African American. He got, Edwards got, in October, Edwards got 41% there. And it looks like he's going to get 50% or more there right now. So that's a big jump in just a month. Yeah, again, just to reiterate, uh, in 2015, he saw a similar jump. Yeah. In the first round, he was at 45%. And then in the second round, he was at 56%. So there's some, some interesting jump going on from one round to the next for Bell Edwards uh, in Morehouse Parish, both, both cycles. Yeah. I mean... Here's another one, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher it. Tang Tanga Pahoa, forty percent of the precincts in, you know. So there's we think there's about six thousand votes left there on the high side. John Bellowers is ten points above his win condition there. I mean that one's trending Morehouse. Um, you know, on the on the flip side, um, you know, we look at Bossier. Risponi is about 3% above his wing condition there. Um, you know, and that, that was right outside where Trump did his rally last night. So, you know, that's certainly helping him out there. Um, or at least correlated. Correlation is not causation, but certainly correlated. Um, yeah. Al Dunson, what a... What are the betting markets kind of saying now? You were saying before they were pretty bullish on Edwards, right? Uh, yep, and still are so. I um, think at last track he was in the mid six, in the mid eighties now. And could you ex could you explain to people who who might be a little bit new to this what you're kind of looking at um, and what's really going on there? Um, sure. So there's a few uh, betting markets out there where you can sort of put your money where your mouth is on politics. Um, and uh, oftentimes they'll have markets for specific elections. Um, they end up acting as an interesting proxy for probability of, of winning. Um, essentially, the crowd's wisdom on what the, what the race is. It goes from zero to 100, which... It was roughly equivalent to the probability of victory. Um, and so think of it as essentially a, you know, real-time Bayesian uh, process. Um, there's uh, a good chunk of political science research on them and whether they are re a reliable indicator or not uh, of, uh, you know, where things are headed. And generally they are pretty good. Um, especially when it comes to election markets, because there's a ton of information out there now. You have, um, you know, just the, the results themselves, but also resources like DDHQ um, and our vote goals and such. So actually, as of now, the, uh, the market's got John Bell Edwards at 93% chance of victory, um, which, you know, if you look at our vote goals and you sort of um, average across the state, um, John Bell Edwards, as the night has gone on, the his overperformance margin has gone up a bit. Um, when the early votes had just dropped um, for most of the state, he was sitting at about a one percent overperformance, and now he's sitting at about a two and a half uh, to three percent uh, overperformance. So um, you know we're getting election day results in now, and uh, at least in most places so far. He ha there hasn't been sort of a Respone wave um, uh, in those election day votes. All right, so another round of who would you rather be right now? <laughs> well, Scott, um, given that the betting markets have uh, John Bell Edwards at a 93% chance, I'm going to have to go with uh, John Bell Edwards. 
Ninety-three percent. I mean, so you so you'd rather be John Bell Edwards, but now let's say you're a you're a trader. Where are you? Are you buying Responi right now? At ninety-three cents, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's that's about you know risk averse versus uh, risk, risk tolerance. No, no, yeah. I said I said buying Responi. Oh yeah, I mean you know me personally. Uh, you know, I'll throw away eight bucks at a chance at a hundred, uh, much faster than I will, uh, put in 92, uh, for something that I think is a sure thing. So me personally, sure. Um, but that's, you know, everyone has their different philosophies on that. And that's actually like how I like to throw around bets. It's not, would you bet on it? It's okay. How much money are you putting on it? Would you put a thousand dollars on it? At those uh, odds, no. Me that's, personally, no. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> but you'd throw ten bucks on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So that's kind of where we're at tonight. Um, and, and that's a better. It's it's not where what position you're taking, but how much would you put on it? Um, Drew, we seen anything interesting coming through? Uh, just looking around. John, John Bell Edwards just took a lead for the first time in right, yeah. a pretty long time. Seven, couple thousand votes. Yep. We've got about 900,000 votes in right now. Um, our middle scenario is about 1.45 million votes. I think there were about 1.35 uh, million votes in the first round. Um, so, and, and in terms of early vote, I'm pretty sure all of the early votes are in at this point, And it looks like we're at about 45% of the election day precincts in, um, we've got three counties complete or sorry, parishes completely in Caldwell, Red River and West Baton Rouge. Um, West Baton Rouge may be the, the more interesting of those three, um, and Edwards is at 57% there, um, which is uh, actually about 1% less than what we had his vote goal uh, for, for that parish, um, which is interesting. Um, so if, you know, if, you're, if you're rooting on Responi, that's, uh, that's one decent sign that you can tip your hat at. <laughs> Um, East Baton Rouge, much bigger. Um, and so we'll see as the uh, election day vote uh, comes, it keeps coming in there, um, how everything is shaping up. Right now, uh, Edwards is about 1% above his vote goal there um, with uh, about 68,000 votes in, but still plenty of more votes um, in East Baton Rouge to come. I mean, what we really found out at this point is the polling was right. It's a close race, you know. I mean, this is not one that that people missed. Let's switch over to the precinct results if we could, Austin. Sorry, we're all looking at all this. So we dropped this link in chat. It's on the blog. You guys can play around with this. Um, let's zoom into New Orleans again. Uh, so we're still waiting for a big chunk out of New Orleans, which would be Jefferson Parish. Currently, Edwards is about a half a point behind his wing condition there. Still waiting for North New Orleans to come in. I mean, pretty much a lot of North. Decent amount of uh, Eastern. Can we go over to Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge? Austin? East Baton Rouge is where um, Responi is about a one point ahead, his goal there. So there's still, 
anywhere from 80 to 90,000 votes left in there. So a lot of votes to count there. But I mean, those, you know, East Baton Rouge, Jefferson, those are the two parishes that, that you know, Responi, need, or I'm sorry, Edwards really needs to outperform. Um, you know, some new votes came in. He was about a half a point below his win condition in Jefferson. Now he's almost a full point below. Not trending good for Edwards, so it's tipping back. Those betting markets may, uh, those betting markets yeah. may be a little bit priced a little bit too high for for Edwards, a little bit too high. That eight bucks is looking pretty good now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, going. I mean, I think everyone was keen on that Morehouse. Morehouse, hundred percent in. Um, and again, it's a key parish we've been watching, and John Bell Edwards outperformed his win condition there by 6%. Um, but, you know, he's he's inching below. He's giving some ground up in some other parishes, and, you know, Morehouse would be a great indicator except for the fact that it only represents about a half a point of the total vote share. So, you know, it's an indicator, but it's not a mover. It doesn't have any heft yet. Yeah. Yeah, on our key parish list, we also have 100% uh, precincts in for St. Bernard. Uh, I don't know. The parish list in Louisiana is pretty much a litany of the saints, and so St. Bernard is one that's 100% in now. Uh, we had Edwards, about 1%, performing above uh, the vote goal that we had for him, uh, kind of winning, winning the parish at 54%. That's, um, that's outperforming... Um, well, the, the vocal, but then also uh, how he was doing in, um, in the second round last time around, I think. Uh, actually, it's, it was a little bit lower from last time, but this, again, kind of like Morehouse, seems to be a pretty, have, have a lot of variation. Um, in St. Bernard, we had, that was a Hillary Clinton at 30% of the vote there. John Bell Edwards in the runoff in 2015 um, was about at 56%, and uh, today we're saying he beat the vocal at about 54%. Um, so this one kind of jumps around a little bit all over the place, but uh, by our by our math, um, one one percentage point above where he needed to be there uh, at 100% of the precincts in now. Let's see if there's any questions. Any indicators for what the turnout's looking like? I mean, the last round beat our high turnout scenarios. This one looks like it's gonna beat our high turnout scenarios in a few parishes and come just below in some others. So again, turnout's looking slightly higher than expected, but not, not anything earth shattering like we saw in Kentucky a week, couple weeks ago. Um, yeah, Morehouse was kind of in the middle of our scenario. Caldwell Parish was pretty, actually, pretty low turnout there. Uh, St. Bernard, uh, closer to the high turnout scenario than anything else. And so it seems to be, I mean, if I'm just kind of reading the numbers very quickly, that um, there's quite a bit of variance across parishes uh, in answering that turnout question yeah. so far. So far, we see about 980,000 votes. Someone asked what we think the total vote, vote count is. Anywhere from 1.4 to 1.7, so we've got you know about a third of the vote left to count. Um, for those of you following along, what you're looking at, these are our key parishes. You can you can access this sheet. All the parishes are in here. These are the key ones. Here's how to read it. This is how many precincts are in. This is the amount of votes um, that we expect to come out of these key parishes. Here's the current votes in each parish. Here's the number of votes we ha we expect to be left in a high scenario in a mid scenario and a low scenario. So what I mean by that is, in East Baton Rouge, in our high turnout scenario, we think there are 92,000 votes left to be counted, and we've already counted 68,000. And of the 68,000 we've counted, Edwards is sitting at 66 to 34. And you might be thinking he's killing them there, he, killing Responi there, and he is, but he's only 0.9% above his win condition in that parish. So he's doing okay, but he's hanging on to a lead in terms of where he needs to be. It's not enough to win. You have to hit your win conditions in each parish because if you look at some other parishes, like go one below in Jefferson Parish where there's 93,000 votes counted, 38,000 left in our high scenario, he's below his win condition by, by almost a point. 
despite him winning in that parish 55-44. I think why yeah. the prediction markets, real quick, Alex, I know what you're going to say just to finish off this thought, why the prediction markets have been keen off on John Bell Edwards, and I think we'd all like to be him right now, but I don't know if I'd be 94% sure like some of these are. Morehouse, which came in early. John Bell Edwards is outperforming his win condition there by 6% which is a pretty good indicator. I think that's what everyone's keying off on. But again, there's still a lot of votes to, a lot of votes to count. So I wouldn't, I don't know if I'm 94% sure that more out, you know, that John Bell Edwards got it. You were going to say Alex? Actually, I actually think that was me. Oh, you were going to say Drew? In. Yeah, I was just looking at, um, you know, one of the early questions was how does a Democrat win in such a right state? And just looking at one of the, the only other down ballot statewide race is the Secretary of State race. There's about 26,000 fewer votes cast in that race, but the Secretary of State Republican candidate is running about 100 and, what is that, uh, 103,000 votes ahead of Responi. So those are other votes, you know, about 80,000 votes that are ticket splitting that are going to Bell Edward, John Bell Edwards because, you know, people just aren't voting straight ticket. Um, he has a certain appeal, and that's what you have to do in a really you know, heavily for one party or the other state, if you're from the minority party, you, you have to have that cross appeal. And he clearly does. Yeah. Alex, you're always the contrarian. Who do you want to be right now? <laughs> why, why am I always the contrarian? That's what contrarians say, yeah. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, look, the, the top line lead is going back and forth. Um, so far, if you, if you sort of keep calm and just look at the vocals, um, of the counties that are hundred percent in, um, it looks like it's a, it, for the most part, it's a very slight edge to John, to John Bell Edwards. But as of now, it looks like there's only one county, uh, where he has actually underperformed his goal which is West Baton Rouge. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it looks pretty good for him. I don't know that I can be the contrarian tonight. Got it. Um, I'm trying to get a tweet here, but there's a couple of people in our election Twitter sphere who have been looking at these results, specifically the precinct stuff and, and running some models and where they're predicting it. And a couple of them are telling me, well, I can't say who yet, they're gonna give me a tweet so I can at least you know, reference it, are saying that John Bell Edwards is, is now tipping above um, the win scenario there. Um, not 92% certain like the prediction markets, but, but you know, with two thirds of the vote in, some of these, these precinct based models get pretty accurate. Um, Here's a perfect example. Wasserman just tweeted it. We'll pull it up as an example. And again, this is this is a perfect example of how this is going to go all late tonight. Austin, can you pull this tweet up? So Wasserman, Livingston Parish, 100% in. Edwards needed 30.1. And again, he doesn't need to win that one. He just needs to get certain levels. He got 29.6. Um, that's a perfect example of what's been going on all night tonight is everyone is within a point of their win conditions. And with you're in with a point of your win conditions, you know, <laughs> these things aren't exact science. I know we've got these things down to decimals, but that's a, that's a false precision. Go back to the vocals for, for a second so everyone can kind of see this. Um... In Caddo, which is one of the parishes right right by where uh, Trump did his rally last night, you know Edwards is seven percent above his vocal there, um, which is which is great. You know if you're him, even though there's forty seven thousand votes left, I imagine that you could certainly give up that seven percent vocal lead right there with the with what's left. Um, but in Jefferson, which has a significant amount of votes, one hundred two thousand votes in so far, thirty thousand left, he's a point and a half behind. Um, you know, this is, this is, this is why this is going back and forth. 
I, I go back. I, I mean, I guess you'd still you'd bet a small amount of money and want to be Edwards right now, but it's not over. Yeah, some of these parishes, it's just wild to me looking at some of the historical returns where we were just talking about Livingston, which Dave Wasserman called kind of a ruby red uh, parish. And I mean, it is when we look at the 2016 presidential. This is a place where the Trump was at 85 percent and Hillary Clinton was at 12 percent. So indeed, ruby red. But then when we look forward to uh, the 2015 gubernatorial, when Edwards uh, got to the governor's mansion the first time, Ed, uh, Edwards got 40% of the vote. And so Ruby Red, yes, but also um, we're th this state level environment where we have a conservative Democrat on the top of the ballot and according to our exit, not an exit poll, uh, people saying that Trump was not a factor in their vote. You, you have a place that you have people who are looking looking at the race and saying, you know, I kind of like what Edwards is doing in the governor's mansion. I might as well might as well vote to keep him there. Uh, so some of these vote goals, um, as Scott's saying, every, people are pretty close to some of their goals in, in some of these key parishes off by a point or two, uh, which is probably an indication that uh, we may be here for a while. Uh, do we have enough beer? <laughs> I guess we got enough beer. I'm, I just got a notice from Google that our public Louisiana vocal sheet is quite being used quite heavily. Yes, yeah, beer me. <laughs> um... Any other tweets worth pulling up while we're waiting for some of this stuff to come in? 1.1 million votes in. 1.1. Just looking at what's in here. Let's, let's look at some of these all parishes. Some of these other ones that have come in. Oh, uh, just a... Quick aside, predict it's up to 95 for Edwards Which is right essentially now. the perfect because predicts it's got a 5% five, five or 5 cent tax. So at 95, that's, that's your bare minimum to make money. Uh, how do you know that, Scott? Because <laughs> I dabble in the gambling of, of elections. <laughs> by, dab, gam, by dabble, I basically I take all of your bonus money and I put it on predict it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, so that explains why we haven't gotten a bonus in 10 years. In 10 years, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going to make it to at least 11 years without a bonus. <laughs> um, let's see if there's any surprise parishes here. Again, so if you're looking at our screen right now, just so everyone knows, you can play, play around with this. This sheet shows precincts in. What, how much vote share we expect out of that precinct? So Acadia, 100% in. It only we expect it only represent 1.3% of the total vote share. There's 19,000 votes. Even though it's 100% in, it beat the low turnout um, projection by 1,500 votes, and it beat our mid turnout projection by about 228 votes. Um, Edwards is getting 28.1% there. He is 0.1% above his vote, vote win condition there, and Responi's at 71%. So he's 0.1% below. That's how you read this sheet. This is how we track it. This is what we look at to figure out whether or not we're going to call it for somebody. Um, you guys can follow along here, and you can see how this works. And you can see we have this for every single parish. Um, and if you're looking just for the macro, what are we looking at, even though this is a mess of data? We're looking at basically Responi and Edwards are trading parishes in terms of being just above or just below their win conditions. Most elections, it's pretty obvious with this many votes in, about two thirds of the expected votes, it's pretty obvious by now someone is you know, consistently beating their, their win conditions across all parishes or counties. They're not trading parishes and counties like Responi and Edwards are, which is why this is so close and why most of us on here who are prolific gamblers are wondering why predict it the predicted gamblers have it at about 95%. I mean, they might be right, but 
it's they, they seem to be a little bit ahead of the data right now. I mean, we're pretty close right now, uh, just in terms of the overall statewide percentage. Um, yeah. Mr. Shankle, what's uh what's the recount situation so in Louisiana? Louisiana is an interesting state because the there are kind of two mechanisms you have. The first is any candidate can request a recount of absentee ballot and early votes. Um, if those votes would be enough to potentially hypothetically change the election. If they are right and those results do change the election, the uh, state pays for the recount. If they are wrong, they pay for the recount. Throw that up for me, Austin. Sorry, keep going. Um, however, there's that only recounts absentee ballots, kind of early votes. To recount your election day, you have to go to court and have to sue, and a judge has to order. So it's if there is a recount situation here, it immediately goes to lawsuit stage. I feel like it's kind of like a football time, like challenge, where like if you're wrong in the, on the absentee, if you're wrong, you get charged a timeout. Like you have to pay for it. They want to <laughs> discourage people from flippantly demanding a recount when they know there's no chance for them to win. That's fair. All right. So while we're waiting for some of this stuff, um, sorry. Looks like Austin got excited and put something in the chat that he shouldn't have. Um, awesome. Can you throw that tweet up from Lenny Bronner for me? So Lenny Bronner is a election data scientist over at the Washington Post. He's a friend of DDHQ, and he is scraping the precinct results from Louisiana tonight, as are we. Um, but Lenny has um, probably forgotten more math than, than I know. And he has been conversing with me and talking and showing me his model. And he basically, you know, it says it in his tweet, the lead of the model is flipped back and forth. The expected difference is at less than 10,000 votes out of figure 1.5, 1.6 showing up. I mean, that's, that's about as much of a coin flip as you can get. Um, basically, that's a very fancy way of Lenny telling us that the math says it's going to be pretty hard to predict. And I think that, that, that's a better encapsulation of, of where it's at right now. I think what he's trying to say is that it's going to come down to crucial Waukesha Parish. Waukesha Parish, yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, this might be one of the few elections that comes down to turnout. <laughs> anyway, keep an eye on Lenny. Follow him. He's tweeting tonight. Take a look at some of his methodology. He's pretty good. Lenny's, Len, Lenny's good at this because he hasn't been looking at elections for so long. It isn't jaded. He kind of takes a different approach than everyone else, which yields some pretty interesting results. Um, can we flip back to the, the key parishes? Yeah, so we're at 1.25 in. Man, this is going back and forth. Um, I, I guess the next big, I guess, bellwether, it's not a lot of significant votes, but how the hell do I pronounce this? Tangia Pahoa. Can we get a pronunciation on that? We're adding, we're adding syllables every time we, yeah. <laughs> we talk the, about the, it. The live stream audience has been very uh, on top of their game when it comes to uh, correcting us. So I'm sure if, if we just ask for it, someone will, uh, will yeah, provide yeah. Some, very quickly. Someone on the, give me a pronunciation key. Oh, Tang. We're, we're going we're gonna to uh, settle this. Yeah, yeah. So Tang Jipoa. Okay, here's the bottom line on that one. 74% of the precincts in, 10,000 votes, so not a huge vote share. But um, John Bell Edwards, 6% of his, uh, six, trending 6% 6 above his win condition there. So again, if you're looking at that, you're like, oh, that, that's, that's a good canary in the coal mine for John Bell Edwards. But in these huge parishes where he needs to win, Jefferson, East Baton Rouge, both of those represent more than 100,000 votes of, you know, anywhere from 8 to 10% of the total turnout. He is literally at his vote goal right now. He's at 0%. In other words, he's not trending above or below it. And there's still 66,000 votes to go in East Baton Rouge. It is a dead heat in these big ones. Um, we're, we're being told it's Tangipoca. 
Tangy Poka. Now they're just trolling us. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, this came from Twitch. They're definitely trolling us. Go back and play some Death Stranding. Uh, you, YouTube, actually. YouTube, but yeah. Yeah, no, I'm looking at the Twitch chat. Yeah, Tangy definitely. Poka. Someone, well, Someone please call me a boomer. On the chat, so I can block you. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, do you want to settle this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's settle this. Settle this once and for all. Okay. Tanjipaho, Louisiana. What? Tanjipaho, Louisiana. All right. There we have it. Yeah. Well, the more you know. Oh, we just got an OK Boomer on the YouTube channel. Wait, we're on YouTube? <laughs> Dude, we're on all of them. Dude, that the program, Podcool. <laughs> I'm just waiting for someone to call it The Twitch. Oh, God. Uh, the, the, uh, the guy who was trolling us with the Tangi Poka says, How dare you accuse me of being a Twitch degenerate? <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure you sub us. Just make sure you sub us. Give us bits. His, um, yeah. his, his, his name is AB, which might stand for Antonio Brown. So that might be what he's up to nowadays, is We're, watching Louisiana election <laughs> dreams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when does the Fortnite stream start? We should, like, pop into some Fortnite every once in a while. Um, Austin doesn't give some love, but he's controlling it tonight, and he is a, you know, he's a, what, at least a third-tier StarCraft player in Northern Virginia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All we know is that his actions permitted on StarCraft 2 are mesmerizing. Um, I don't know what any of this means. Yeah, sorry, I will get back to the election stuff. <laughs> um, he perishes. I mean, we, we really just need to get the next big update. We got to see, we got to see, the, you know, 92,000 votes left in East Baton Rouge. Literally, John Bell Edwards, 0.9% of his vote goal there. I mean, he could give all that up, you know, with the 92,000 votes that are still out. Um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's too close. Too close. What is Jay Miles tweeting? He's probably got something interesting, right? Now, Scott, could you just explain again? Now, if I'm looking at this sheet, we're about at 80, we're at 81% precincts in, one point, a little bit under 1.3 million votes. We have Responi up. Yeah. Uh, why, why do we still think uh, Edwards is the man to be? Well, I... I, I mm. Very recently, we did say. We Maybe, did unless, say. Unless, unless, unless you've changed your mind. Yeah, I, I guess here's, here's why. Right? Predict it, 93 cents, 93 Edwards. 93 cents, well, predict it. Again, it, it's, it's not It's perfect. stuff like that is the reason why I make money on predicting. It's, it's a trailing like indicator. Like, yeah, there are stupid people who put money on there. I'm sorry, not stupid people. Please... Keep putting your money on there so that I can also put money on there after you. Wow. Um, wow. No, the reason why they're doing it is Morehouse, right? So Morehouse was a parish, 100% in. It was all over the Twitters, and Edwards, you know, beat his win condition there by 6%. And Morehouse, 47% registered African American. Um, Edwards got 41% in October. He's getting 48% now. When he won in the runoff in 2015, he got 56%. Um, so he's certainly not doing as well as he was in 2015, but he's doing better than he was just recently in October. I think people looked at that and said, hey, that while it's not a lot of votes, 8,000 votes, they said that's a, it's a good indicator of what the rest of the rest of the parishes are going to look like. And that had to have been, what's 1030 now? That had to have been at least a half hour, 40 minutes ago. Um, but if we look at the other key parishes, I mean, you know, John Bell Edwards is not 6% ahead in every single one of the parishes, or 6% ahead his, his, his vote goal. Um, you know, in Caddo, he's 3.7% he's above. Trump was, was near there the other night doing a, doing, a, doing a rally. 
but there's still 27,000 votes to go to left to, on a high turnout scenario to be left counted there. So you could give that 3.7% vocal lead up. Um, and I think that's why we're pretty cautious about this. Would you agree? I yeah probably I yeah. think I mean Edwards is the commentary that we keep seeing on Twitter and that we keep sharing um, I think he's constantly that they're kind of at their vocals but yeah. no one's blowing past their vocals which yeah. is why maybe we're airing a little bit more skepticism than say the betting markets yeah um. Yeah, so like even Jeffrey Skelly of 538, we'll pull his thing up. He had, he had a pretty, it just kind of cements where we're at. He, we're not the only ones who do vocals. Austin, you can pull that tweet up when you get a chance. All right, so Jeffrey Skelly, 24 parishes are now 100% in, and on average, Edwards is running just 0.1 point ahead of the win mark, right? So when he says win mark, I mean, that's our version of the vocal, right? Um, so, you know, he's running at 0% in East Baton Rouge, 0.6% ahead in Jefferson, 0.1 in Jefferson Davis. Um, and this is weighted by turnout in the first round. Yeah, I get it. Basically what he's saying is, look, it's too close to call right now with anywhere from two to 400,000 votes left to be counted. Um, you know, that slim 0.1% lead to get above the lead he has in his vocals could be erased. Um, and that's why Responi still has a shot. Um, you know, if you're John Bell Edwards, you need East Baton Rouge, you need Jefferson to come in big. In both, the, I'm sorry, yeah, East Baton Rouge, Jefferson, um, Caddo. Certainly, Caddo. I mean, Caddo has more has more outstanding votes in our projections than than Jefferson does at this point. So, um, you know, these are the ones he's got to pull out. If we look at the larger larger map, these are just all the parishes. Can you go back to the vocals real quick, Austin? I mean, we're highlighting it for everybody, but yeah, they're just going back and forth. I guess here's an interesting one, Rapides. 67% um, of the precincts in, 18,000 total current votes, between 23 and 27,000 votes left to, left to count. John Bell Edwards is 8% above his win mark there. I mean, those are the ones he's got to pull out. But on the flip side, uh, like where's a good Responi one? So, I mean, Livingston here, Responi's one and a half percent above there. I mean, he's got to pull some stuff out there. Go ahead, Alex. So one here's the thing, right? So I think I think we generally tend to be on the um, uh, more. Uh, uh, we're more reserved when it comes to, oh my God, you know, Edwards looks like he's on his way to victory or responding. We, we tend to be a little bit, you know, we, we give the benefit of the doubt to the, the candidate that seems like is in a inferior position. I, I kind of feel like Rasponi is even, even though on DDHQ, you know, he's still up. Um, he actually it just flipped again. Um, he seems to be running out of, uh, runway. Um, a lot of his counties are 100% in, and you've got East Baton Rouge and Orleans counties, uh, sorry, parishes, um, sitting at 35% in and 47% in, um, respectively. To me, that's kind of the ball game. There, there really aren't enough votes in the rest of the state to offset those two, those two parishes. Um, with everything else, you know, statewide we're at 82%, and I don't see a lot of red parishes left, uh, and, you know, they tend to be smaller, too. I don't, uh, I think this one might be um, headed for, uh, for being done. 
So while you were talking, Wasserman called it for John Bell Edwards. Yep. And I've been tabbing through some of these old county stuff. I don't know. And if I were on predicted now, I'd probably push all my chips on Edwards because you probably get some value now. Which is a nice way of me saying I don't blame Wasserman for calling it. We're going to have to be a little bit more reserved than him just so we can be sure. But if you're a betting person, it's probably a safe bet. And why do we think that? You just look at this. These key counties, this is all positive. This is all positive for Edwards right now. 1.4 million votes in, maybe two to 300,000 left. And every single one of the key counties, he's at least at his vote goal or exceeding his vote goal. In the key counties, he's exceeding his vote goal by 1.4%. In Bossier and Cotto, which is where Trump was doing his rallies, to the extent that you think correlation is causation, he is 0.8% and 2.4% um, above his vote goals there. Okay, just this is your friendly neighborhood political scientist telling you that causation and co is, is not a core. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Correlation is not causation. <laughs> yeah, we have a predicted latest yes price 99. <laughs> Got it. Do you think there's a chance? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We got to see a little bit more coming in, but I mean, we'll say it on the live stream because we're not officially calling it. I, I would imagine we're there, right? Podcool, do you feel any different? No, I think I, I, I think I agree with that. that. Uh, I mean, Dr. especially Dr. looking at looking at the vocals yeah. um, that we're that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, just the, the number of parishes where Edwards' performance above the vocal, um, he's just doing pretty well. Now, I, I don't think, and you could just tell by how close this race is. State, I mean, statewide right now, we're still at Edwards 50.4 and Responi 49.6. Um, but Edwards is doing well in the single digits performing above um, his, his vocals. And so there haven't been many places where Edwards is unbelievably uh, beating Rasponi by double digits above the vocal. Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he's pretty near where we've had him, which is why this is such a close race. But if you just look at the, if you look at the density mass on, like, on a histogram, such as on my Twitter feed, uh, you'll just see that it's, it's, there are just too many parishes right now where he's beating those vocals. Yeah. One other thing too, if you look at our overperformance map right now, um, it looks like a lot of the strength in terms of yeah, how much he's improved map. since the first round and how much uh, he's improved relative to expectations comes from the north part of the state. Which, if I remember right, Rod Cole or Drew, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that is where Responi's um, uh, uh, Republican counterpart was from. Is that is that not right? Say that again, Alex. Um, the north part of the state, I believe, is where Responi's uh, Republican opponent in the uh, in the first round. That's where he was from, I believe. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. he, he represents that, Louisiana 5. Yeah, and that's where uh, Edwards has uh, improved the most since the first round. Um, you want to walk through what this, uh, um, this overperformance map is? Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, Al Dunson. Al Dunson. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. Um, so essentially what this is is just a map of those uh, vote goals performance versus uh, overperformance versus underperformance that we have on the sheet. So it's, it's just a graphical representation of that. And so you, what you can see is the north part of the state 
um, Edwards has, relative to expectations, done really well. In the south, in the southern part of the state, it's been sort of a, a mixed bag uh, between the two. So it could very well be that Edwards' inability to sort of uh, coalesce the Republican vote around him might, might end up costing him tonight. Hey, Austin, it looks like our stream froze. Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened. The stream froze on a previous version of the vocals. See if you can switch back and forth. There you go. Yeah, so this is the map that I was yeah. I was talking about. Yeah. So you can see you can see that the north part of the state um, Edwards has performed very well and and in this in the southern part it's been sort of a mixed bag. So Responi's inability to sort of uh, coalesce that area around him um, is probably going to be the difference maker um, here tonight. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Sheets updating. You can obviously go to the link live. It'll be all live there. We just had a small production thing. You guys will see the tweet. We're calling it for Edwards. All right, and so it's official. So at the beginning of the night, we were talking about Trump taking a risk in coming here um, three times in, in one month. Um, after already having suffered the, the loss in Kentucky that he tried to, he and his team tried to spin as, a, as actually indicating that he was very a very good campaigner. Um, so what do we think? What, what does this mean? I, I think I'm, I, we're still trying to make sense of the numbers here. Um, but, I mean, Alex, I think, I don't know. I, I was, when we had that conversation, I was on the team of I don't understand why he would get into this race. I take Drew's earlier point of if he got a flip, that would be something to brag about. Um, but I think especially in a race where I understand the, the national political wins in the state, but there were just too many state level factors where I think it was a little bit too much of a risk. Now, I, they might, sp if I'm team Trump, I'm not sure how I spin this. Maybe just he was a popular conservative Democratic governor, but I, I don't really know um, how else I would spin it. So, yep, we just tweeted it. You guys heard a little bit before the Twitterati. We called it. Um, we're going to stick around. I'm waiting for some cool J. Miles Coleman maps we can kind of break down for everyone. I think I saw Sean Trend had some some of his fancy multi-axle graphs and all that kind of stuff. A scatter plot. It's called a scatter plot. Multi-axle fancy <laughs> graph. <laughs> one, well, one other note, too, is um, uh, so the Republican – Republicans in the state legislature were also trying to gain a supermajority, and that was seen as sort of an attainable goal. Um, as of right now, if the if the results stay the same, it looks like they will fail to do so. Um, there's still some votes to count, so there's a couple districts that could potentially still flip. But if if, if the if the votes were final as of now, um, they would they would. Uh, not reach that supermajority, it looks like, by about two districts. So we've called it. I don't know. Has the AP called it yet? I don't think they have. I know some yet. others have. I haven't seen the yeah, AP. Has the AP called it? Dan? No. Just lost it. Keep an eye out. Let us know when the AP calls it. It'll just show up first. Yeah. Okay. Ben, you can you can help him look at that. Let's try and find some J Miles tweets. Yeah, Chris, that was designed so that you could hear us talking.
All right, we'll give Podcool some love. Let's throw this tweet up here. I guess we were just on it. Never mind. You got you have plenty of love. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What about this tweet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Seven forty five PM Is he three hours behind? What's that timestamp? Yeah, seven forty five. He must be west. West coast? Yeah. Isn't Jay Miles in Virginia tonight? Can't be right. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's just a computer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's stalk his Twitter for a moment. I don't see a whole lot. Someone give us something to look at. We're Sean Trend. J Miles went to bed. Now that it's called, J Miles went to sleep. I don't think he's gonna sleep for a while. They won the Super Bowl. <laughs> you got a, you got a, a Louisiana election that the whole country paid attention to. Yeah. It's a happy day. Orleans and East Baton Rouge, uh, Baton Rouge, uh, are now about two thirds in. Bienville is is the only other uh, parish that's below seventy five percent in at this point. Um, so, and, and that's reflected in the margin now. Uh, John Bell Edwards with about a ten thousand vote margin. Um, as Orleans and East Baton Rouge keep coming in. Um, I would only really expect that to grow. There's, looks like about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten other parishes that are not 100% in. Uh, most of those favor um, uh, Responi, but uh, not enough votes in there. In fact, it looks like out of those counties, if you add up the number of votes that have been cast in them, they roughly equate to one of Orleans and, or East Baton Rouge. So just not just not any votes uh, outstanding for Responi that could um, offset uh, those two parishes. And in fact, the margin will probably grow a bit. Well, it's just, just another, another big dump from East Baton Rouge that, yeah. We're sitting at 1.42 million votes, um, which means we'll probably end up somewhere right around, so, somewhere a little bit north of the middle uh, situation uh, scenario, but um, not, at, not at our high scenario. Yeah, like one point five, one point six, probably. Uh, probably one, probably. Uh, I would say probably about one point five. Yeah. yeah. Let's look at this again. Go back to the uh, the spreadsheet there, Austin. Yeah, so Morehouse led the way. Six, you know, Edwards was six point four percent above his vocal there, and literally led the way. In all the other key parishes, he was anywhere from a tenth of a point to zero percent. Yeah, just enough to hold on. And I love it. All those people who were buying in to predict it right around like 9 45 10 o'clock with that morehouse are going to think they called it ahead of time but look you have 50 of these races tonight like it is you could have 20 30 different results can't be a free looks like it looks like the ap just called it
The AP just called it as well, so congratulations. <laughs> Alex's echo sounds like a Drew. <laughs> uh, okay, we got a Sean Trend graph that we can break down that actually explains some shit. Austin, you want to pull that up for us? Take a look at this tweet. Okay. Sean Trend, massive overruns of baseline in Jefferson, makes up for losses everywhere. Is that yeah, a really fancy way of saying it came down the turnout? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's a massive overperformance. He overperformed by about 0.7%. I mean, New Orleans suburbs, which I guess would be, yeah, Jefferson. Pull up our precinct map there, Austin. Pull up, pull up Louisiana. Uh, yeah, pr or New Orleans. Okay. I mean, our overperformance math doesn't agree with this. Are you, what do you make of this, Pod Cooler, Alex? Uh, well, John Bell Edwards overperformed it? up in Shreveport, up in northern Louisiana, not necessarily in the New Orleans suburbs. I'm trying to figure out. I mean, Sean's usually pretty good at this. So, so his, his baseline, baseline is the 2015 vote. Whereas yeah, our baseline, baseline is, yeah, uh, is yeah. the is the first yeah. graph. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, because our overperformance map. I mean, John Bell Edwards did what he needed to do up in northern Louisiana. Right. Yeah. 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 He's, he's he's looking at the change from 2015 to to now, which makes sense. In our estimates, this sort of dynamic where uh, places like Orleans, Jefferson. And East Baton Rouge, uh, uh, Edwards went up in, and in a lot of the small counties, Edwards went down in, was already baked in essentially because we had already observed that trend in the first round. And so, what we were trying to do here with our uh, vocals was uh, essentially use the first round as a, as a baseline and say, okay, now a month later, with you know 200,000 extra votes what does Edwards need in order to win this head-to-head? -head. So it's just the, essentially like a uh, different denominator here. Gotcha. So that's what we've seen everywhere, but people thought, well, the suburbs aren't as large and Louisiana compared to the rural vote, but again, in a really tight race, it's small incremental gains. Yeah, yeah, so, so what's, what's left, left to be said here? Not a whole lot. I, I guess here's the thing, right? AP headline, Louisiana's John Bell Edwards stuns GOP, wins re-election to a second term as the Deep South's only Democratic, Democratic governor. Did he stun the GOP? In the race that was 50-50 the whole time? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. Yes, Deep South, only Democratic governor. Trump goes there a bunch of times. Polling's close. But I don't think anyone is like, what the fuck happened? 
Not to the level Bevan was. The polling was, was, was absolutely spot on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing when you're watching this, is, is punditry, you know, this is the whole big thing you feel about Twitter, right? punditry versus data. And then you, you have these storylines, story and, and sometimes they intersect, and sometimes that methodology gets you to the right answer. answer. But who, who, who uh, you unless you just parachute it in, you're not surprised about this. You're not surprised, about about you're not surprised that, that Matt Bevan lost. lost. I mean, John Bell Edwards was, was for most, most of his first term, he was at or above 50% approval rate. Yeah. So it's not like he came out of nowhere. Matt Bevan in Kentucky was essentially for four years the least approved of popular governor in the country. Why, Why would anyone be surprised he lost? Yeah. You know, we, we, we get, get so, so caught up in these national storylines and we want to shoehorn everything in to make them fit. Some kind of, you know, know politics, politics is still local and candidates matter. Yeah. You know, John Bell Edwards just did a good job as governor. You know, yeah. people like him. It's, it's not, not that complicated, it's not that surprising. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, just building off that point, it, we were talking about it earlier and maybe we want to pivot from it, but in our not an exit poll, I mean, we found that even among the Democrats in the state, they, they tended to be more moderate Democrats. The plurality of Democrats on the ideology question said they were moderates. And it just seems that John Bell Edwards is probably just a good fit for this pretty red state. I mean, Trump won the state by almost 20 points in 2016. And yet here we are again um, saying that a Democrat is, is going to be the governor in this deep red state. Um, I think this case, maybe, maybe even more so than Kentucky, this is just a good case where I think the candidate matches uh, the electorate a little bit uh, pretty, and pretty well. nothing about Trump's popularity. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, that, and that's Trump what our... Has, Trump has a coalition, and it showed up for him. him. Now, that would put to the test. test. And, and you, you want to say, well, is there a historical precedent for that? Well, well let's, let's go, go all the way back in history, history to, I don't know, Barack Obama. Obama. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the guy <laughs> had it, had it, had a, a rock solid base that showed up for him, and it was transferable to absolutely no one else. Right. Yeah. And I think I think probably that if if you had to, if I had to pick kind of one key from the not an exit poll that we did. I think the number one key is one in two Louisiana gubernatorial voters said that Trump had nothing to do with their vote today. No. And that's, that's a very high number because this is a question that's typically asked in exit polls. And so you could go back in history. That's a very high number that one in two people would say that the, that the sitting president has nothing to do with their vote. And now, is that what we're going to see on CNN or MSNBC? No, that I think it's automatically going to be cast as to a grade on, um, a grade on Trump. But I think, Drew, you're completely right in that these coalitions aren't always uh, transferable despite what the popular punditry might say. So, Louisiana is not in play next year. Okay? <laughs> yeah, that, that's out of the way. Exactly. And neither now, is Kentucky for the Dems to yeah. knock off McConnell. Right. And no. the other thing, too, is this is much more the norm historically. You know, it's the last couple of hyper-partisan cycles where you, you, know, you don't see presidential tickets splitting from senators. You used to see a lot of places where you would have two senators from opposing parties. Now you hardly ever see that. You know, now, now I, will just, I, I will just make the point that I think uh, this is sort of a recurring trend post-2018. The, the national environment of sorts still tends to be uh, uh, favoring Democrats because I think if this was an environment that was favorable to Republicans, then you don't have Bashir and John Bell Edwards pulling it out. Um, and so, I, you know, going into 2020, I think I think it does tell you one thing, and that's that overall the the national environment seems to still lean Democrat. Alex, we're talking about an incumbent governor who won in 2015. So, <laughs> I mean, but what, uh, what I'm saying is, I don't necessarily know if this is a reflection of the national winds. Maybe, maybe we will never be able to know. But I think, we're talking I think it's very so, clear. I think, I think it's very clear that this race was much more nationalized than the 2015 race was. You can see that very clearly in the parishes how they voted. You can see that in Sean Trent's uh, analysis there, where the the urban areas and the suburban areas went stronger for Edwards than they had in 2015, 
and then the rurals uh, turned against him. I don't think that um, I, I don't see well, the I don't see the connection there to it being a nationalized race necessarily. If, and, but if you, I mean, obviously we have Tennille's tweet up there that supports what Alex is just saying. But if you read Wasserman's analysis, Wasserman says what killed um, what killed Responi was the Abraham voters staying home. Right. So and and. And, and for those and watching home, the Abram voters, he was the Republican candidate who lost to Responi. So you're Had saying, and, I, and so, I don't, and I don't disagree with that. Well, I but guess if you agree with that, is, then it's not a nationalized suburban fallout <laughs> trend. And thus, we can't add up all the Republicans and add up all the Democrats. <laughs> here, but it's here, so here, easy here. to just add. <laughs> here, here's what I I'm told here, to be no math. Yeah. Here, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that if right now Elizabeth Warren was president. And this was a an election that would happen, you know, somewhere in, in the middle of her of her term. I don't see John Bell Edwards pulling this out. Guys, there are like three hundred people listening to us argue right now. <laughs> um, I told you by the end of the night you have to reevaluate your life choices. Yeah, I, I mean, it's funny. Some of the people are dropping in chat. Look. This is there. This is inconclusive to say the least. This is what the last election we're gonna cover between now and Iowa, right, Drew? There's no special in December. Yeah, no, there's no special. Wisconsin seven got pushed back. So the next time you hear us cover an election will be Iowa. So that's like a lifetime. There was an Iowa poll that came out tonight. Pete <laughs> Buttigieg ahead, outside of the margin of error. Yeah. Um. Good turn. Yeah, I mean, look, the takeaway is the argument's going to be, and we're going to probably spend hours and hours talking about it next November, is, is this suburban vote, which has been the, the overarching, you know, theme since 2018, is the suburban vote leaving the GOP? And have, did we see evidence of the suburban vote leaving the GOP and costing them a, a governor's race in Kentucky and costing them a governor's race in Louisiana? But what did they leave the GOP for? Yeah. Right? That's yeah. the question. Yeah. I mean, they didn't the, leave the GOP for a progressive Democrat in really either state. Yeah. Wait a second. In chat, no UK election. I take that back. No, oh, you can yeah. We might have an announcement later on the UK no, election. Let's really on that. We'll, we'll talk about that. Well, this is the last US based election. Yeah. Um, so that means this is, it can in this matter, right? And, and Alex, yeah. let me ask you a question about that. Listen, about this. What was the national mood in 2015? We had just come off a big midterm for the Republicans, and then everybody thought the mood in 2016 would be for the geo for the Democrats, turn out to be for the Republicans, and yet Edwards won in the middle of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, uh, what I would say to that is that. You know, there's a Trump effect. Um, Trump is, I think, the catalyst for this rural versus uh, urban um, shift that has happened, um, and that wasn't present in 2015 yet. Um, and so, you know, you you, you see you see very clear evidence of um, that effect in this race. You saw it in Kentucky. You even saw it in in uh, in Mississippi. Um, it's just you know the Republican pulled it off there. Um, so, you know, I, I, th I still think you're over extrapolating, though. We're talking about two cases, I think, that uh, are not necessarily indicative of can, this movement that you're you, talking about. I can give you I can give you over four hundred thirty five cases. <laughs> last, last no, I, 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 no, 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 I understand your I understand your point. But every like, for example, on Kentucky, everybody points to Bevin as being the big failure of the GOP. But every other statewide Republican won that night. And here we're talking about the most conservative Democratic governor in the country uh, winning Absolutely. a reelection campaign. And so all I'm saying is that I don't necessarily know if this is, if this is exactly the phenomenon that you're pointing out. And the, the Republican state, Secretary of State is running 109,000 votes ahead of responding. And and I 100% agree with you. I'm say not making again, the Drew? argument. Whoa, whoa, I'm not making again? the argument. Hold on. I'm not making the argument that this uh, this environment allows uh, Democrats to win in Kentucky and Louisiana, etc. What I'm saying is, given the faults, given given the faults of the Republican candidates, or the strengths in this case of the Democratic candidates, 
Right. The national environment is what allows them to pull off the victory instead of narrowly lose. So Bevin, for instance, I think would have held on if the environment was a little bit more favorable to Republicans. John Bill Edwards would not have pulled it off. Um, another example of this, for instance, is, and this is a more exaggerated example, is Alabama Senate with Doug Jones, right? Um, he very narrowly pulled it off in 2017. Um, I think that he would not have done so if there was a Democrat in office. I don't think he would have done oh, so wait, if wait. any other Drew. Republican in America was on the Drew. ballot. A hundred percent. A hundred percent agree with you. But I, what Hold I'm on. saying is it's sort of the last oomph over the over the hill, right? Alex, we get it. You, you think this is a trend. We need like a round the horn mute yeah. buttons. Yeah, yeah we, we get it. You, you, you think this is a trend and it's going to project everything in the future. It's a theory. But how many votes ahead is the Republican Secretary of State candidate in Louisiana, Drew? Uh, roughly 280, somewhere in that range. Yeah. 280,000. So... If you tie that to the Kentucky story, where all the statewide Republican candidates won except for the unpopular governor, that is the counter argument to the Republicans are collapsing in the suburbs. And both can be true. The Republicans can be collapsing in the suburbs, and they can still be pretty safe in red states like Kentucky and Louisiana. And there's a lot of ands here. This is a pretty complicated thing. And lose two governor's races in those states in the same year. In other words, they can be losing, the GOP can be losing the suburbs, they can lose two governorships in red states, and those red states could still be very red states come 2020. All three things can be true. Yep. But I mean, did the, so did the, the Republican the, AG the, candidate in Kentucky even lose the Cincinnati suburbs? I don't think so. Yeah, but it's not about losing whether you won or lost it straight up. It's where did you go in previous, previous, uh, I, previous I, elections. I, I bet that those Republican yeah. candidates underperformed yeah. Mitt Romney. Hillary Clinton won Miami-Dade but got killed in Florida. So, yeah. All right. Brandon's telling us we got everything in. These sheets are going to stay live all night. Feel free to take a look at them. Um, keep an eye out just to recap for tonight if you're still listening you're awesome um, we have live precinct results you can check that map out um, we were the first major news order to call the race tonight um, so we're going to continue that trend up um, we've got these live streams coming I, I think you can, you, can, you can expect us to do this um, into next year um, we may have some international stuff in the future so we got a lot to play around with here um, send us some notes as we kind of make some adjustments going forward. But is there any any closing thoughts? Pod cool, Alex, Drew, any any anyone here? Twenty nineteen's done, except for maybe an international. So we can focus all our attention. Um, maybe tease one thing that we talked about, possibly a podcast in the future, near term future here, to uh, get your fix on this, since we won't have U.S. elections, but. You know, keep an eye out. There'll be a lot of news from the decision desk in the next couple of weeks and months. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. You can cut it.